uh, this is an interreligious age, and we're learning from each other whether we want to or not. It's just every great city on the earth has almost every practice of religion going on in it. Uh, and if we can't respect ourselves, or, hu or humanity, across those barriers, uh, well, we are in trouble. Uh, and we, we need our Buddhist colleagues and our Hindu colleagues and our Islam, great Islamic colleagues to solve the problems of religion in the world and to filter up into the social patterns the kind of profound humanists we're trying to access here. We know that Gandhi was not a Christian. He may have learned something from Christianity, but he was, he was a Hindu. Malcolm X was a wise figure who was a Muslim. We have to have this feel in our organizing, or reorganizing our Christianity, if we're going to be Christians, or our Buddhism, or our Hinduism, whatever you're organizing, if you're going to organize or reorganize some religion. And this, for me, is a basic series of insights for this interreligious age, that we find our way to understand that all these religions in their great form are talking about many of the same things uh, that we can access in our own lives. Uh, and that's the key to the dialogue. When you get on a subject, general subject like awe and profound humanness, uh, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, are all accessing that in some ways. Now, Christians might access some things a little bit better, and Hindus might access other things a little bit better, and we learn from each other in this interreligious world. We're, we're wor er, working in the 20th century out of different master metaphors than they had to work with in the first century. So, translating the Bible out of the primitive, ancient, metaphorically use of the Bible into metaphors that are speaking to us today is a big problem with the theoretics of Christianity. And every religion has something like this in its theoretics. The word spirit is a problem word. And so partly we have a semantic problem here. When I use the word spirit, I mean profound humanness. So what we did this morning on accessing on the profound human we have to access. That is our, our love, our, our freedom, our overcoming of despair with trust. All that has to do with our profound humanness. So if you have a spirituality, as you call it, that helps you access profound humanness, right? You might, if you have a practice of some kind of whatever you call spirituality that helps you access profound humanness, then you have what I mean by religion. It may not have a, full, a name like Christian or Buddhist or something, but spirituality and religion are a name for the same thing. A lot of what people call spirituality is a rather self-constructed sentimentality or is a, or is a new age fabrication of self-love and things like this. So I'm a little leery of the word spirituality because it's not grounded very well for many people in daily solitary practice. Every week getting together with members of your practice. Every year going to a retreat that has to do with your life. You know, something like that. Practice uh, is the key to religion and spirituality. Both. Uh, if it's a genuine spirituality, it's helping you access your profound humanness. Uh, now, Understandable. A lot of people have avoided the word religion because the religions that they have experienced, both sick Buddhism and sick Christianity and sick Judaism and sick Islam, uh, they don't want to hear the word religion ever again. <laughs> so they want to use the word spirituality for good religion, which is valid for their, but we have to ask them what they mean. And if spirituality means for you, you want a good religion instead of these sick ones, uh, but you're actually dealing with the same issues. Do you create a spirituality based on Christian heritage, Buddhist heritage, no heritage at all, but some new heritage? You're creating religion or spirituality that serves you and your, your, your colleagues and friends. But basic metaphor or primal metaphor, what, this, what that word is saying is that in the West, we had different primal metaphors for our religious creation. And in the East, they had 
other primal metaphors for the religious creation. And this little chart is trying to say what those primal metaphors are like. Uh, so in the West, which uh, this, is, this is the Arabian, Arabian West, which incorporated itself with the Athenian Greek heritage, these religions all began as Arabian experiences, which accessed Greek culture to enrich themselves with. So in the West, we really have a blend of the ancient Hebraic Jerusalem Arabic heritage with the, the Greek heritage of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and so forth. So that's the West, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. And the East is primary, or in terms of the, the great religions, the most expansive religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, which uh, lives out of, for many, for, for all Hindus basically, and, and many Buddhists, out of the Indus River uh, area of India. And then Buddhism went into the Orient, into China and Japan, and other places. Uh, so Buddhism has its Oriental forms and its India forms that are quite different. But all of them have this basic, all the forms of Buddhism and Hinduism have this basic Ur image operating. Uh, except the Orient has, I won't go into the Orient. I'm basically talking about India here, <laughs> ancient India up into the present time. is functioning out of these kind of terms and their meaning, while we in the West are functioning out of the left side of the chart and their meaning. So let me look at, first of all, just what Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, and I'll start with Hindu terms, are doing. They're basically saying with the term Atman, what we're saying with great self, or profound humanness, uh, or in Buddhism, no self. So the Atman is the great self, the true self. And Brahman means the uh, mysterious wholeness of being, which are familiar topics for Christianity, but they are looking at them differently. And that great saying out of Hinduism, that I am, uh, holds together for Hindu lore something very basic. They're saying that overwhelming up againstness, up against which I'm up against, the wholeness of being, I am. I'm part of that. I I'm finding my unity with that is uh, what enlightenment or nirvana uh, means. Uh, to find oneness, to find identity uh, in this Atman level of, of life, the real I. Uh, Hinduism and Buddhism tend to be solitary religions, and meditation, at least for Buddhism, tends to be the basic religious practice. So you get a certain feel of what that Ur is like. It's focused on consciousness and the becoming at one with the wholeness. Uh, while the Arabian image on the left-hand side is concerned with dialogue. Uh, there's the I-thou dialogue between human beings, uh, goes back and forth. Uh, intimacy, that is sharing the communication uh, of your soul, of your mind, of your body, of your, th this is a, a primary metaphorical feel for the Arabian Ur, or the Arabian primal metaphor. And then we is an important category. The people of Israel, the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, these are all terms that have to do with being a community of people. And we in history relate to the thou that's facing us in every historical event. So this we thou, being the people of God who respond to God, uh, being the kingdom of God on earth, uh, responding in obedience to God. This we thou, uh, when there's another kind of intimacy metaphor, is very basic to those three great religions. Time and history are very basic. And so far, thinking together as Christian renewal experts, we create this little wedge blade, which has to do with the fact that the great thou is being responded to by the people on the front edge of that wedge uh, and on behalf of leading all the people in the wedge of humanity 
toward adequate response to the great thou. Something like how history is providing us with the demand to do something about our climate. That's, that's out there. It's not something inside me. It's an encounter I'm having with a demand to save the planet from global warming or from poverty or from aristocratic uh, arrogance or whatever is happening in my history. So this is one of the great parts of Judaism and Christianity is understanding there is this out there reality that those traditions tend to call the almighty. The almighty that is encountered in every historical event. So if the Assyrians are attacking Jerusalem, uh, that's God <laughs> sending the, the Assyrian conquerors to beat the shit out of this uh, society who is off, off target and dealing with the reality of being conquered by the Assyrians is the awesome response that we need to make to the awesome. So that's what we mean by the, the first person of Christian Trinity is that up against this, up against which you're up against, when you're up against, you're really up against it. Uh, that we we're out to have people realize that they're limited as well as put in life. You're put in life and you're limited in life and both being put and being limited is an experience of the up againstness that's called the Father or the Almighty in this heritage. The Holy Spirit then refers to this profound humanness that is spelled out for me with the concept of awe. The awe of trust, the awe of freedom, the awe of love. These qualities are being awed by the awesome. The we are the odd ones, the ones that are awed by the awesome. So this spirit of that tradition means uh, accessing that experience of being awed by what's out there, the finally awesome or mysterious up against this, up against which I'm up against. Uh, so those are ways of coming at that problem. I don't mean out there to mean some religious doctrinal group who's cramming their stuff down my throat. Uh, I mean the reality that all of us are up against, whether they want to be or not. This, this one, one reality here, uh, a very mysterious one <laughs> that is confronting us. Yeah, you, you, God is a kind of a code word that means different things to different people. It also means devotion to. Uh, so, Everybody has a God in the sense that you're devoted to something. Uh, so it is kind of important to define what you're devoted to. So I'm using the word reality to help me. Also the awesome and the mysterious land <laughs> I'm having to live in as a, other words to, to talk about the God that is my God or my devotion. So all, all that has to be sorted out. Yes, there. This mysterious no, I'm up against, this Brahman that runs the universe, I am. Which means to me that the all and the awesome are inseparable. If I'm awed, I'm awed by the awesome. If I'm encountering the final Brahman, I'm participating in the Atman. That that's the insight out of which that tradition was built. Uh, but it's very solitary. And it doesn't take history and time as seriously as I'd like to take it in my tradition. See, in my tradition, it's not a Atman all oneness, but it's a historical encounter with a demand for justice. <laughs> well, the, the Brahman is symbolic for the exterior, that. You see, the that. Not me, that. But, that. but that I am means that you face an elephant, face charging you, that elephant, I am. Uh -huh. So it, it is a real encounter they're speaking of with the Brahman is a, a, a pointing category out that way. This elephant is coming at me, but elephanthood is part of who I am. So I'm not facing something alien here. I'm just facing my awesome world awing me. <laughs> Well, what I'm saying is both of these metaphors are valid. 
They help us access our profound humanness, and both of them are finite metaphors. They have limitations. Uh, the Eastern metaphor has some limitations relative to communal life and justice, in my view. And the Western metaphor has some limitations about really getting serious about the radicality of your interior being. So the contemplative gifts of the East are very valuable to we Westerners. We have to have both, have both are dynamic. I do not foresee, however, the world becoming all one religion. We're gonna always have a great variety of religious practices. But in an interreligious world, we Christians need to learn from the Buddhists. And the Buddhists need to learn from the Christians. I mean, the Christians that are really getting hold of their Christianity. Uh, because this is the world we live in. We have to be, we can't have a whole continent of Christians. There is no such thing anymore. And we can't have a whole continent of Buddhists. There is no such thing anymore. Uh, so we are going to be an interreligious world with a great variety of religious practices, but all those practices to be good are helping us access something universal about being human. Now, now that's a very controversial insight. Let me tell you a little story though. I was in Australia teaching a eight week program for people that had six uh, Aborigine people in this program. And I never encountered a culture more different from my own than I encountered in this Australian Aborigine. I mean, they were isolated for thousands of years without any agriculture, without any uh, civilization at all, just tribal life over 12 or 15 or 20,000 years old and older, you see. And this culture just mystified me. Uh, but these people participated in the course. I didn't know what they were saying about half the time, but when I caught on what they were saying, they were telling me a story that was a better answer to the question I asked for grounding than some of my white Australian friends, you know, who were more rational, but just didn't have that mystical something or other that the Aborigine members of this course had. And one morning, I'd given a lecture on uh, the, the land of mystery. And after that lecture, this tall, thin, Aborigine man, as black as that statue, uh, comes up to me and says to me this line, which I have never forgotten. When you talk like that, I hear you in my own stories. My own stories. I don't know what the hell his stories were. I probably wouldn't have understood them if they just told me. But he recognized that what I was talking about, he was talking about with his stories, and that we were members of the same humanity. That's what I mean. These cultural barriers are very real, very difficult to overcome, but they are overcomable. Uh, we are a same species. We have the same bodily, mental, physical, spiritual essentials, and we can communicate with each other uh, if it's done well enough. So that's, a, to me, a living story that holds my view intact <laughs> that uh, behind all of our differences, we are one humanity. And that's what I mean by profound humanness.